Hey, welcome to part two. We're talking about electron packing. Last time we talked about the electrons inside the atom a little bit, but kind of left it fuzzy. Now we're going to start talking about how they're packaged inside of our atom. Okay, so to understand electrons packing, we're going to need to talk about light. There's a couple of reasons. First off, light actually behaves a lot like electrons and vice versa. So to understand one, you do start to understand the other. Second, the way we understand electrons, most of what we understand about them comes through experiments where you shine light at an atom and see what happens to it. Well, we need to understand what light is doing in order to understand that. And this takes us back to the 1600s and so, uh, time of Sir Isaac Newton. There's a debate. What is light? Uh, is light a particle? Or is it little tiny particles that fly out of the sun and candles and the back ends of fireflies bounce around and into your eyes and that's how you see? Or is it a wave, like ocean waves, sloshing through the air and through the glass and through the water and whatnot? And that's how you see as they lap against the back of your eye. Well, both explanations make sense. They both explain things about light. But the two are different. So, okay. Well, let's look at waves and particles. Uh, waves... Uh, tend to pass through different substances, and when they do, if the substance is, that they're hitting is not at a nice straight angle, they're going to slow down and change direction. They'll slow down either way, but if it's at a weird angle, or anything but head on, they tend to bend. And waves do that. So, hmm, that sounds like a wave. If they come from two different sources, uh, you're going to get an interference pattern from your light. And that's kind of what you're seeing in the trippy GIF up here. And light does create an interference pattern. It's a little hard to see, but you can do it if you've got, say, a CD and a laser. Shane a laser on the bottom of your CD and watch it bounce around. Hmm. So light's a wave. Well, not so fast. Uh, light also behaves like a particle. Light is traveling through space. Space is a vacuum. Now, of course, Sir Isaac Newton didn't know this because, you know, no rockets back then. But space is a vacuum. Waves have to go through something. Up through the early 20th century, there was thought that maybe it was traveling through this thick fluid that, you know, we couldn't detect. But now we're pretty sure if there was some kind of weird thick fluid, we would have detected it. And we had a couple experiments that were pretty clearly showed that, no, it's going through a vacuum, which is kind of weird, okay? Now, particles, particles go through vacuums. Particles can simply travel. Second feature about particles. As a particle hits something, it stops. It creates a shadow. So if someone is hosing you down with a bunch of water, the area behind you is going to be dry. Well, if you're out in a bright light, the area behind you will be darker. It's your shadow. Shadows are properties of particles. Hmm. So which is it? Well, Newton was pretty sure. And after Newton, it was basically agreed. Light must be a wave. Newton invents optics. Optics require that light is a wave. Yay. Light's a wave. Asterix. So let's talk about light being a wave. And really, this falls into just about all waves. All waves have four primary properties. Now, one of these isn't shown for light, and I'll get to that on the next slide why it's not. The one you don't see in the picture is amplitude. That's how high the wave is. So if you've got the boating forecast, they'll say how high the waves are. That's the amplitude. Little waves, eh, big waves, go over your boat, you're in trouble. That's the energy for most waves. Once again, not light. Light's got something slightly different going on. Now, all waves, and we're talking about transverse waves, ones that go up and down, kind of like an ocean wave. There are sound waves that go back and forth. Similar story, but different. We're not going to deal with them. If you measure peak to peak, or really any one spot of the wave to the corresponding next part of the same wave, uh, the distance between those two is known as the wavelength. Uh, the upside down Y is called a lambda. It's a Greek letter, lowercase in this case. Uh, so that's the Greek letter lambda, and it's going to be wavelength. Now, if you were to stand and have the wave lap against you, the frequency that it does is its frequency. How often does it hit? So how often do you see peak, peak, peak? That's going to be frequency that is not a squiggly V. That is the Greek letter nu, which looks like a squiggly V. 
yeah, basically what happens is we've got one alphabet, and that's not enough, so we had to add the Greek alphabet to get enough letters to sort out everything. And in fact, it's still not enough. We had to make up a few things. The last property of all waves is their speed. They don't just instantly go where they go. So a wave is going to take time to get there. That is going to be its speed, which is the frequency times the wavelength. Now, for light, here's an interesting quirk. In a vacuum, it will slow down if it's trying to go through air, or water, or diamond, or whatnot. But in a vacuum, that speed is fixed to be a little bit less than 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. That statement has a lot of really weird uh, effects that I'll let someone uh, teaching physics cover. But essentially, if you move faster, <laughs> time changes in order to keep that number fixed. But that's convenient for us. Speed of light, which we give the letter lowercase c, that's actually a lowercase c, is fixed. So if you know the frequency or the wavelength, since you also know the speed because it doesn't change, you know the other. So you can directly interconvert frequency to wavelength. Now I should also point out, as is shown in the picture on the lower right hand side, when we talk about frequency and wavelength, we are essentially talking about color. Now, we do separate the two because color is a subjective thing. What you see as blue, I might see as cerulean. What you see as orange, somebody else might see as an, a yellow-red. Uh, not all cultures have all seven colors in their language. Other cultures have more. I mean, you know the people who have blue and blue and blue, and the other person, you know, it's, it's cerulean, it's midnight, it's lav some other shade of blue. I'm, I'm more of the blue, blue, and blue kind of guy. So in sciences, we use wavelength and or frequency. And we tend to use wavelength, just kind of a, a tradition thing. But it is essentially the same thing as color, just more objective. Now, remember there was an asterisk, light's a wave. It is a wave, but it's also a particle. It is what we call a wave particle. And this required an Einstein to sort out, Albert to be precise. And what, uh, Albert Einstein had sorted out was this weird phenomenon. And this is actually the building blocks of our digital cameras. So if you take a metal and you put it in a vacuum and you just run an electric, well, you can't run an electric current through it because you're not going to connect the circuits. But if you put an electric voltage across it and then you shine light on it, if the light has a high enough frequency, a low enough wavelength, then you will kick off electrons. If it doesn't, you won't. The more light you pump onto it, if it is a high enough frequency, the more electrons will come off. If it is not a high enough frequency, then nothing happens. This is called the photoelectric effect. It was kind of a mystery. What Einstein sorts out is what's going on is that light is in discrete packets. This had been already bantered around by Max Planck and a few others. Light is a discrete packet. It's a wave particle. It's both. A, it's a wave that is itself also a particle. We call this a photon. Each photon has a certain amount of energy, which is described by its frequency times the constant, which is known as Planck's constant, lowercase h, and that's the amount of energy for the photon. Tiny, 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 tiny amount of energy. If the individual photon hits an atom and its energy is high enough, then it can put enough energy into an electron to knock it clean off the atom. If it hits an atom and it doesn't have enough energy to do that, then the electron will go further from the nucleus and then return back to the nucleus. It doesn't fly off. The more photons, the more atoms that get hit, but since it's insanely unlikely that the same atom would get hit twice, you don't see electrons flying off if you don't have enough energy to knock the electron off with just one photon. Thus teaching us that light is both a wave and a particle at the same time. This also makes life a little bit more sane. It explains the particle dynamics. Why can light travel through a vacuum? Because it's a particle as well as a wave. Also explains things like black body radiation. With black body radiation, you can uh, determine the temperature of something because whatever its temperature is, it's going to cause energy to be released in the form of light, uh, electromagnetic spectrum. You know, light is a broad category. 
and the energy of the photons coming off is proportional to the heat of the thing. This makes sense if you've got discrete clumps. If it's simply a wave that's not in discrete clumps, well, couldn't you just get a lot of a lower energy wave or a little bit of a higher energy wave? Whereas if you're getting packets, you know, it's how much of each packet you get. Now, turns out the electron is also a wave particle. Everything in the universe is actually a wave particle. The more mass you have, though, the more particle-y you are, the less mass you have, the more wavy you are. Turns out anything the size of an electron or smaller is going to be pretty wavy. Once you're up to a proton, you're basically a particle. The wave properties of it is essentially non-existent. It, it, it's there, but it's really low. Now, this actually starts to explain things. If you go back to the Bohr model, you've got the waves, or sorry, the electrons around in shells. Why? Well, they have to be able to form what's known as a standing wave. The GIF in the upper right-hand corner is a standing wave. The spots where it's not moving, those are called nodes. For a standing wave to take place, essentially the wave is bouncing back and forth between the two ends. But it has to make sure that as it's going, it doesn't accidentally cancel itself out. The nodes have to be in the same spot. The ups have to go with the ups and the downs with the downs in order for this to happen. Essentially, your wavelength must match relative to your uh, total length. It doesn't have to be one to one, but it's going to have to be an integer ratio. And not just about not all of the integer ratios. So you're going to have to hit some specific integer ratios. This is how a stringed instrument works. You got the bridge on one end, you got your finger pinching down on the fingerboard on the other. That determines the length of the string. Only certain standing waves can generate in the string because it's that length. Move your finger, different standing waves, different note. Now, the reason that we're looking at our atoms, the shell, the area around the nucleus, and then with Schrodinger's models, the orbital, so the sublayer, those are the regions of space which are the right size for an electron to create a standing wave around it which explains why Bohr's model it makes sense. Now, things get a little bit more interesting. So you've got Bohr's model. Uh, you've got your different shells, one, two, three. If you've got a electron, it's a wave going around it. It's not really going around like a planet around a sun, but it's more like a wave around a circular string. If you add energy in the form of a photon, you can kick it up into a different one of those shells. It will hang out there very briefly, and then it will tend to go back to a closer one, emitting the same energy that it absorbed. Possibly in multiple steps, possibly in a single step, just depends on what it feels like doing. This gives us a couple of properties. The most interesting one are distinctive spectra. Each element has slightly different electronic and properties, different numbers of electrons, different charge and the nucleus holding them together. The exact energies are slightly different. Well, that means that it takes a different size photon because only a photon of a specific energy is going to do anything. If you don't have enough energy in that photon to go all the way to the next shell, the electron cannot exist part way between the shells because it would cancel itself out. Just like you cannot play an E on any length of string, you only have certain lengths of string which you can play an E on your stringed instrument. Each one of the spectral lines then essentially is like a different octave, although somewhat more elaborate than that because you can go not just shells but orbitals and it doesn't have to be a single or a whole jump. This allows us to identify different atoms based on their spectra. This is how we know what elements make up stars. We're able to see the spectra from the element in the star, thus telling us what the electrons are like and that then tells us what the element is. We actually discovered helium on the sun using this before we discovered it on Earth. The key thing to remember here, though, your photon must match the jumps in energy. If it doesn't, it just ignores the atom. If it does, then it can be absorbed. And if you add energy to the atom, it can emit light, but only on those wavelengths where the electrons are bouncing back and forth. Now, the shells can come in a couple different sizes. By the way, uh, the best image I got on the top right is using uh, labeling from x-ray spectroscopy 
the K element in. We don't use those as chemists. That's usually one, two, three. Okay. Each of the shells, um, different sizes, different distance from the nucleus. You can get different wrappings and orientations for uh, your electrons. So it can be spheres or donuts or other weird shapes. Uh, but the farther away, the more elaborate you can get. That means that your innermost shell can hold two electrons. The next shell can hold up to eight electrons, then 18, then 32. The key parts for us as chemists, the inner shells of electrons, the ones that are full, and then there's another shell that's got more electrons on it. Those are called core electrons. The, those are mildly interesting, if not somewhat boring for us as chemists. What we really care about is the outermost layer of electrons. So you've got all the electrons, they're packed into their shells, they're buzzing around, but the outermost one's the one that's gonna interact with the world around it. That's where the chemistry takes place. That's what we call the valence shell. It's the outermost one. So for this sodium, we have the inner two. So one, two, those are cores. This third one, which only has one electron in it, that is the valence shell. It's the outermost shell. Now, interesting quirk that we're going to see in unit four, that valence shell tends to prefer to have eight electrons. That's going to govern a lot of how our chemicals are going to be formed in ways that gets that valence shell to either have eight or zero electrons. As I've been mentioning, and as I talked about on the last time, those orbitals don't have to be spheres. These are Schrodinger's orbitals, at least a few of them, uh, in the graphic on the left-hand side. The farther away the shell is from the nucleus, the more elaborate the shape in which the electron can occupy. That shape is the orbital, and you get a few more choices. You will notice uh, that some of these are labeled things like S, P, D, and F. Those correspond to uh, the shapes. Uh, the letters originally it was a great idea that they were going to match line shapes from the spectra. It turns out it had nothing to do with anything. It would have been cool if it had. Uh, when you're looking at a periodic table, we've got regions that we call the S block, the D block, the P block, and the F block. The reason we call that is that in those reason, regions, these shapes of orbitals tend to be the ones influencing the chemistry the most. So in the D block, the chemistry of those metals, also known as transition metal block, is most heavily governed by the interactions of D orbitals. In the S block, it's S orbitals where the chemistry is really governing. They are not exclusively governing by a long shot. It's just a region where for those elements, that orbital is influencing why its chemistry is different than other elements the most. It's a somewhat subjective thought, but it does really start to make sense of why certain things behave similar because they've got orbitals that are dominating their chemistry. Okay, that's electron packing. We are not diving in nearly as deep as we could. The textbook is definitely going to dive in deeper. We're not going to go quite so deep for this class because while it's interesting, it's not that interesting. Okay, See you on part three here shortly.